you so much for having me. I'm so excited, especially to be presenting during our month. <laughs> so this is really exciting. Um, so yes, and welcome everyone. I hope you guys um, really um, are able to take away, you know, some really helpful strategies as we move forward in doing our um, racial and social justice work. <clears throat> so today's topic was developed for two reasons. Number one, racism on all levels has been prevalent in communities across the globe. We've been inundated by um, this through all media outlets, you know, and sources. And number two is June, this coming June marks the beginning of the requirement for implicit bias training for healthcare and mental health professionals. So there's going to be a lot of discussion and unpacking around race and racism. So it is my hope that um, you develop, you know, the skill set that's necessary to navigate this sometimes very tumultuous uh, terrain, or perhaps just add more tools in your coping toolbox. <clears throat> so I'd like to preface by um, sharing that in this presentation, I'll be reshaping you know, a narrative of people of color by highlighting images that normalize therapy, self-wellness, happiness, wholeness, and just merely existing. Um, I've chosen bold colors that showcase the, the many textures and uh, personalities to uplift those who are often marginalized. So um, whether you have either experienced racial battle fatigue firsthand or through the lens of others, um, whether you have imposed racial trauma on others, either knowingly or otherwise, this training is definitely for you. And I do want to add that this is a lunch series, so we're not going to um, really delve too heavy. I'm um, going to just introduce, you know, a couple of topics and, you know, just to help you gain some familiarity with the topic as we move through this um, lunch series and as we go about our, our work um, in the community. <clears throat> oh, I have to share my screen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> so um, before we can discuss racial battle fatigue, we must first discuss racial trauma. So let's look at the definition of racial trauma. Um, it's defined as the physical and psychological symptoms that Black, Indigenous, and people of color, also known as BIPOC, experience after exposure to particularly distressing and or life-threatening racist experiences by white supremacist people, policies, and systems. <clears throat> So this trauma, it can either be real or perceived. It can be directly experienced or witnessed. It can be interpersonal or systemic, and it can also be passed down within communities across generations. So now that we've kind of discussed racial trauma, let's kind of dip into racial battle fatigue. And um, it's also known as R, uh, RBF. So racial battle fatigue is the cumulative, not one, not a couple, but the totality. So it's the cumulative psychological, social, physiological, and emotional impacts of racial micro and macroaggressions and racist abuse on racially marginalized groups, particularly Black individuals. <clears throat> so, um, hmm. so attempting to cope with these race-based stressors that can be persistent, hostile, violent, demeaning, dismissive, and toxic, it can completely deplete one's physical, 
emotional and mental energy. So essentially, it is a very daunting and exhausting experience. <clears throat> so I'm going to, I want you guys to, if you can, to take a screenshot of this or um, make note because we're going to come back to this, um, these symptoms a little later when we're doing our self-care plan. And I didn't want to break this slide up. I wanted to leave it all on one slide, um, excuse me, to illustrate the magnitude of these symptoms. And so, so some of these symptoms and these signs, either you can relate to these personally, or you've seen these symptoms in others, perhaps in your clients. And I really wanted to bring attention to the internalization of racist um, attributions. So I'm doing um, some other work uh, as a pilot uh, program and it's called ACES. And so ACES, of course, is adverse childhood experiences. And one of the um, questions for eligibility is, have you ever experienced racial trauma or historical trauma? And I always get the answer, no. And no was okay, but with the population that I work with, no was highly unlikely. And so what I do is, is I, um, I kind of tweak it and I ask very specific questions about racial trauma and historical trauma. And then they always go, oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I've had that happen to me before. And so that just goes to, you know, the internalization and the normalization, you know, that is just something normal and ordinary when it really shouldn't be. And so um, I try to do my best to, you know, ensure that um, people that families I'm servicing understand and be able to identify, no, this is a stress or this is a symptom. So I want to throw a poll out there. If Danielle, if you can launch the first poll, um, whether or not folks have experienced racial battle fatigue symptoms, either presently or in the past. And you, you can just answer yes or no. So we can get that first poll launched. <clears throat> Dwayne, are you able to launch it? It says um, that I'm unable to. Uh, yep, it's launched now. So folks should be able to choose their option. That about it? So we had about a little over 50% said yes, 28% mm -hmm. no, and about 20% unsure. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that's a good start. Looks like everybody's at the right place. <laughs> All righty. Um, can we, I, I'm interested for those who, who said yes, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of um, hear a little context behind that and, and those symptoms. If someone, if you could raise your hand or I'm not sure how you want to do that, Danielle, or come off mute um, and just kind of share just a really brief um, context and a little background about those symptoms. You know, um, where it was it a particular place? Was it a particular experience? Um, just to kind of share some insight into your, into your yes. Yes, folks. So if you would like to share, feel free to unmute. While people are, are getting their thoughts together, I'll share um, one for hypervigilance. And I know for me, that's really big for me, the hypervigilance, um, because of you know my, my background as a medical social worker, because of what I've seen, because of what I've experienced firsthand with my family, I am extremely hypervigilant in ensuring that um, implicit bias um, or you know discrimination 
discrimination is not happening with myself or my family. And so um, Danielle is aware of this story, but uh, my husband was recently hospitalized and I packed everything. I packed food for the whole day. I packed my laptop. I packed several chargers because I was going to be present that entire time to ensure that, you know, my husband was, um, you know, treated, you know, with dignity, with respect, and that his needs were being met. You know, there are, there's um, research that still shows that health providers still believe that um, Black um, people have higher pain tolerance and denser bones. So our pain levels, um, our pain management isn't um, managed appropriately. And so for me personally, hypervigilance is a, a very strong uh, symptom that I experience quite often. Was there anybody else who wanted to share any of their symptoms in uh, context? No pressure, we can keep going. So let's, let's talk about the, the, the stress toll. Um, I want to always make sure that when we talk about self-care, that we talk about it in relation to health care. <clears throat> and so under stress, the body releases hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And these hormones, they kind of turn off some functions like our immune system and they turn on short energy, short-term energy reserves. And after the stress is gone, the body returns to normal. However, when that stress is persisting, meaning that there's no opportunity for breaks, that's when the stress becomes toxic and begins to affect your body. Um, and racial battle fatigue, when unaddressed, can lead to health concerns that require physical and mental health treatment. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the, the short-term effects of stress to the body, and I'm referring to the image here. Um, and so some of the short-term effects is feeling worried, nervous, uh, unable to, to kind of switch off. That heartbeat, it beats harder and faster to pump more blood and uh, to the major muscles. You know, skin becomes more sensitive, you know, more, more oily. Um, and then some of the long-term results are, you know, tension headaches, migraine headaches. It can lead to mental health problems, as I've stated, um, trouble breathing, hyperventilation, and panic attacks. So you have your uh, symptoms of racial battle fatigue, and then you also have um, those symptoms of when that those stressors are persistent and then there's no time for it to really dissipate so that your body can return to a normal state. And um, you kind of go into that fight or flight. And I know I'm talking to a full room of folk who understand uh, the whole premise behind fight or flight. And then there's also, you know, your body is always prepared to, to always be in a reactive mode. And we know that that just isn't a healthy space to be. <clears throat> and that's when we you know, start looking at um, self-care and different ways of coping. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about coping um, with racial battle fatigue. I pulled this um, off of a social media site and I love to use it when you know, talking about coping with traumatic racial events. And it was um, you know, kind of back when the um, political climate was just kind of turning its tide to getting um, kind of unhealthy. <laughs> um, and so I, I enjoy it because it really, excuse me, it really helps us look at more manageable and reasonable, realistic ways to address you know, these stressors. And so the first thing on here is to increase self-care. Now, you can use any existing techniques that you already have and that work well, or you can jot down or screenshot any that kind of resonate with you throughout this uh, presentation. <clears throat> and then we have connect with those that validate you. And basically what this is saying is find your tribe, find your village. Find people that share your life vision and your mission. 
Okay. And then we have journal and write it out. And this is really a releasing of sorts, sort of like uh, physically removing it from your own will. And I'm not sure if you ever if you've ever heard of um, a God box, but it's a physical, tangible being. And it's a box that you place your worries in and your stressors, and then you forget about it. Um, and this box can be a shoe box. It could be a jewelry box. It could be a crock pot box, just a box that you're physically writing, you know, your stressors down, putting in that box, and then you're forgetting about it. Or journaling. And I know journaling is really popular, you know, for a lot of people. So like I said, this may be, these may be some strategies that you're already uh, utilizing. Um, next is actively be an advocate. And that's whatever it looks like for you. You can donate to causes that support racial equity. You can check racism as it happens on your watch. You can use your privilege for good. And when I say privilege, I'm referring to unearned privilege and earned privilege um, because there's power to be yielded from both. Um, so using your privilege for good, uplifting your marginalized um, colleagues or friends or neighbors you know, in their ventures. And then we have to actively avoid triggering videos and accounts. This is a really big one, you know, in my opinion, because uh, we're in a day and age where, you know, everything is very visual and uh, we're consuming a lot of information at any given time, you know, on our tablets, on our cell phones, on our laptops, you know, wherever there is uh, information to receive. It's just very much um, crowding, you know, our spaces. And so what I want you to understand is you have the power to control what you see. You can mute, you can take a break, you can unfollow people in accounts that are triggering or disruptful to your peace. Um, I know that for Facebook, there's you know, the little um, options that you can choose and it, 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 it'll give you the options. You know, do you want to unfollow this person for good? Do you want to just mute them where you can kind of take a break for a while? You know, you kind of control what enters into your space because that is something that we do have control over, especially when it becomes disruptful. And then we have take um, what no one is time to power off. You know, that's a big one. You know, and if you're in a space where you can't literally turn your devices off, then perhaps changing your notifications on your devices, perhaps turning it face down. Um, you know, there's just, there's, there's a lot, you know, that's, that's happening now. And we have to learn that we are not powerless in how we, you know, navigate and how we receive information. <clears throat> so then we are moving over to, you know, some real life tangible, uh, self-care strategies. And before I get into that, if we can launch our second poll, I'd like to know who has a self-care plan that you utilize daily. Not that you just have a plan because anybody can have a plan, but what we'll is a plan if you're not implementing it every day. So I'd like to know in this next poll, um, who has a self-care plan that you utilize daily? Give folks a few more seconds. Like it's pretty close. They're right about 50 50. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. 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 Great. This is helpful <clears throat> because when I, we self care pretty hard at Harambe Care. Um, we weave, you know, self-care into um, the field instruction curriculum for our interns or when we have our social work interns. And this is actually one of the handouts 
um, that we use. And I want to kind of go over a couple of non-traditional um, self-care strategies um, because we always hear about how, you know, there's this big spa day or buying, you know, rewarding yourself with a big ticket item or going on a nice vacation, you know, on a nice, you know, beautiful, beautiful tropical, tropical beach. beach. And that's good. Now, don't get me wrong. That's, that's, that's good. But there are also other strategies that you can do that, you know, basically have no cost. Um, and so let's look at some of the non-traditional um, topics. So let's look at social. So what does social uh, self-care look like? Um, there's boundaries, setting good boundaries, you know, having, you know, a good support system, positive social media um, um, activity, communication, time together, and knowing when to ask for help. You know, there's no shame in, you know, asking for help. And then we have um, self-care strategies around space. You know, your actual physical safety and ensuring that that is, you know, in, um, um, uh, in, intact. You know, healthy living environment, security and stability and having an organized space. And we know that because visual pollution um, can be a nightmare and wreak havoc. So just looking at different ways, different strategies in, um, in self-care. And then we'll look at one more that's sort of non-traditional um, and that's financial self-care. You know, um, having a savings, you know, budgeting, good money management. Sometimes it is good to splurge as we talked about earlier and paying your bills. You know, that can also be a stressor when there's not proper management but, you know, just imagine how you feel after, you know, you've had all your bills paid and you don't have bill collectors, you know, calling you and, you know, you just have that, that sense of space and that peace. And that's kind of what we're, what we're looking at. So this might be one, another screen that you want to screenshot for later on when we do our activity. Um, but we still had a good majority of folks who have their own strategies in place. So you might not need it. <clears throat> so let's look at other ways um, to cope with racial battle fatigue. So let's look at recognizing and increasing your awareness of your reactions to the stress. What do you feel? How's your body reacting? You can re refer back to the signs, you know, and symptoms. You can refer back to the body slide. You know, are you having um, shortness of breath? Are you being hypervigilant? Are you feeling kind of numb? Have you checked out? Are you having, you know, those, um, those reactions? Because being able to recognize and increase your awareness, it allows you to know when it's actually time to take action. Um, and then we'll look at number two, learn to deepen and slow down your breath. Relax, you know, relax your body and your mind. And you can practice this exercise, you know, um, five minutes every hour. And anyone who's ever attended any of my previous um, self-care or um, implicit bias trainings, you know that we do self-care together. You know, I really believe in teach back and, you know, um, observing and being able to provide feedback just to make sure that, you know, we're all on, you know, the, the same page. So let's do this one together. So um, I'll do it first and then you guys are doing that. So we're gonna find our center. Just take a couple of regular breaths. And then you're gonna breathe in for four seconds. Hold it for four seconds. And then blow out through your mouth for four seconds. So you're breathing in for four through your nose. You're holding it for four seconds. And then you're breathing out for four seconds as if you're blowing out a candle. So I'll do it for first and then you do it next.
okay? So everyone find your center, take a couple of normal breaths, and then I want you to breathe in through your nose for four seconds. Hold it for four seconds. And then blow out through your mouth for four seconds. And this is deep breathing. And so this is something that you can do whenever you're feeling, you know, those symptoms and those signs that are creeping up. Um, this is something that um, you can do even when you're not experiencing those symptoms because practice makes perfect. And it's good to already have this woven into your everyday um, strategies and just, you're just finding your center and then you're just gonna get yourself situated and then you're gonna breathe in through your nose for four seconds, hold it for four and then blow out your mouth for four seconds like you're blowing out a candle. And people tell me, oh, deep breathing doesn't work. Well, it works if you work it. You know, you have to know how you know, to do it. And so um, getting that oxygen to your brain really um, has an effect on um, relaxation. Okay, so we know how to do that. Um, and then, so number three, recognize your stressors and triggers. That is just being able to identify and what those triggers are. Because when you learn your triggers, you know how to avoid them. And then you also know how to manage them. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, what is my trigger? You know, is it a particular person or a page that is racially triggering? You know, is it a visit to the doctor's office? Is it a colleague or is it a boss? You know, being able to identify, you know, what those, those uh, triggers are. And then moving on to number four, um, decide what you can and cannot control or change, accept what you cannot change and then change what you can. And so this one and the next one also overlaps um, with some of the self-compassion that um, we're gonna talk about in just a few moments. And so the last one is practicing mindfulness. You know, keeping your attention in the present moment with full awareness and acceptance without judgment. <clears throat> so let's move on to self-compassion. Um, let's launch our third and our final poll. I wanna know, um, Who's familiar with self-compassion strategies? Are you familiar with self-compassion strategies? That'd be our, our final poll. There we go. Excellent. Well, this is good. We're at 70% yes. Excellent. All righty then. Close that out. Um, well, that's, that's good because this is kind of where we're going, you know, when we're looking at self-care. Um, because self-compassion is, is a very, very powerful tool, you know, when dealing with difficult emotions that come about with racial trauma that leads to racial battle fatigue. Um, you know, it can provide the emotional resilience that's needed and enhance well-being. So I've had a previous training where one of the um, participants described one of my self-care presentations as uh, life transformative. And as I've gotten more comfortable uh, with self-compassion, I can honestly say that self-compassion strategies are also life transforming. You know, it's just a, the whole premise behind, um, you know, giving yourself what um, you have often given to others. And so Dr. Kristen Neff, um, who's the co-founder of the Center for uh, Mindful um, self-compassion, she's actually um, leading the effort in self-compassion work. And so, as I mentioned, I rarely discuss self-care without adding in um, self-compassion. And so I pulled 
some of this from her, uh, her book um, entitled Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. And so in her book, she explains that self-compassion, um, it entails three core components. Um, the first one is self-kindness. Um, and that's basically being gentle um, and understanding with ourselves instead of being harshly critical and non-judgment. And then the second is um, the whole common humanity in the human experience. Um, and so feeling connected with others um, in our experience with life instead of feeling isolated and alienated by our suffering. And so it is in this this mindfulness that we hold our, um, our experience um, in a, it's what we call that balanced awareness. And so being in that space of balanced awareness um, instead of ignoring you know, our pain um, and exaggerating it. <clears throat> so our looking at the first one for self-kindness, and that's basically how do we respond to others when we feel pain, when they feel pain? So when others are feeling pain, how do we respond to them? We show empathy, right? We provide comfort. We show kindness. Well, self-compassion and self-kindness means that we also are deserving and worthy of the same to ourselves. So it involves actively comforting ourselves responding to ourselves just as we would, you know, to someone else who needs it. And, you know, kind of sitting there, you know, in, in your own pain and saying, you know what, this is really difficult right now. You know, how can I care for myself? How can I comfort myself, you know, right here in this moment? And one of the easiest ways to um, soothe and comfort yourself when you're feeling, you know, badly is to give yourself a gentle hug. You know, we tend to forget that our skin is a very sensitive organ. And research shows that physical touch, um, it releases um, oxyt uh, oxytocin. And this provides, you know, a sense of security and it soothes distressing emotions and it also calms cardiovascular stress. Um, I talk a lot about oxytocin when I'm doing um, work for um, my breastfeeding work. And so when we're talking about breast milk supply and infant bonding. So it's really exciting to um, be able to sit here and talk about oxytocin um, as it relates to self-compassion. I could do a whole nother session on, on oxytocin. <laughs> um, so the next time that you're triggered, you know, by racial trauma, or if you're experiencing, you know, symptoms of racial battle fatigue, give yourself a nice, warm, and long embrace. And, you know, Dr. Neff, she also suggests tender, tenderly stroking, you know, your face or your arm, because we want to, you know, um, get that oxytocin going, those feelings you know, of security and, 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 and um, warmth and tenderness. And so let's try it now. Let's find our seat, get centered, and just give yourself a nice, warm embrace. A nice, long embrace. You know, um, you can also, you know, gently stroke your face you know, stroke your arm, you know, generating that oxytocin, you know, this is a gesture of feelings of love and, and, and care and tenderness. <clears throat> and if you're in a space where you can obviously, you know, hug yourself, you can just kind of hold yourself in a very, you know, non-obvious way as well. Because the key is to get that contact. <clears throat> Next, we have the human uh, connectedness, the human experience. And just like feelings of kindness, um, there's also that feeling of connectedness that activates the brain's attachment system. You know, we have a human 
tendency to come together in groups to feel secure, right? And so usually people who feel, you know, more secure um, and, you know, they're more connected, they're able to show a great sense of resilience. And that's what we're looking for is resilience um, in times of suffering um, and in pain. And so this can mean, you know, joining a community-based organization that uplifts BIPOC individuals or marginalized communities or joining, you know, a social media group or follow um, pages that support connectedness. Sort of that those groups and that connectedness that, you know, makes you go, wow, you know, they get me, you know, I belong here. And, you know, I really, you know, feel the humanity. <clears throat> and then finally, we have mindfulness. And that whole mindfulness it, it gets us ready to develop, you know, our, our, um, our self-care plan. And when you're thinking, when you think about it, you know, it, it kind of helps us be more centered so we can make, you know, decisions that are healthy and sound. Um, you know, it helps us consider, you know, those proactive steps instead of that reactive steps, you know, because um, when you're in a place and you're centered and you're present, you know, you get to acknowledge, you know, what is my next step? You know, do I need to take a break? You know, do I need to set a boundary? Do I need to schedule with my therapist? You know, do I need to tell this person that their race-based comments or behavior um, is upsetting and ask for them to discontinue that behavior? <clears throat> and so when you think about mindfulness, and that whole being able to um, let go of what you can't change and you know, acknowledging what you can, it helps, it brings me to the serenity prayer. Um, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the serenity prayer. <clears throat> so right before we jump into our plan, um, let's do one more exercise. And this is a grounding exercise. And it's, um, you know, the five, four, three, two, one exercise. And um, I want you to find your seat and get centered again for our last activity. And, um, you know, just ground yourself and take a couple of, you know, deep breaths. And I want you to quietly notice five things that you can see. Four things that you can feel three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste. And you know, this is a really um, quick exercise that you can also do um, in addition to um, the deep breathing that kind of brings you back um, to your center. So, this is just a little bit about why, you know, we need a self-care plan. Um, you know, it's a prevent, um, preventive measure. It takes a, away, you know, the guesswork and it helps you um, stay the course. So I want to um, spend a little bit of time right now to kind of come up with a realistic um, self-care plan. So I want someone, I want a very, very, very brave soul to volunteer to develop um, a self-care plan. Someone who's bold and ready and, you know, prepared to, um, to come up with these strategies that we had a huge percentage of people who are already familiar, you know, with their self-care strategies, already aware of um, self-compassion. Um, self so who's gonna volunteer? Um, just take yourself off mute and we're gonna walk through um, a self-care plan. And this is gonna be a good way um, to learn strategies to have it individualized specific for you and where you are. Do we have any brave volunteers? I'll jump in. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually lit at the top of my picture list, so <laughs> it worked out well. Okay, so we have Eric. 
Okay, Eric, what are your signs of racial battle fatigue? Your signs or symptoms? How do you know? Um, I, I would say what comes to my mind is, you know, feeling angry or feeling attacked. Yeah. Okay. Um, feeling angry and feeling attacked. So those are your, your signs and symptoms. So what would be your self-care strategies? Uh, in that situation, or are we talking about daily? Um, in that situation. Hmm. What could you do? What strategies could you implement when you're feeling uh, attacked and um, angry? I, I, first thing that comes to my mind is perhaps, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but uh, uh, stepping away from the location to some place where I can allow myself to calm down, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, then calming down, <laughs> mm -hmm. if, you know, as, as is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And um, are there people that you can reach out to for support once you have cut down or when you're in the moment? Should the situation be appropriate for you to do that? Well, what first comes to my mind is I could uh, reach out to my wife or family or friends. There you go. Um, do you have any helpful reminders that you would add to your self-care plan? Helpful reminders. I don't, I don't understand exactly what that's asking. Well, um, something um, in addition to something that can help um, trigger your memory on um, when and who to call, what strategy to use based on what um, sign or symptom that's presenting. Sort of like the acuity. You know, if you have a splinter, you know, you wouldn't go to the ER. But if you're having symptoms of a stroke, you will go straight to the ER. And so depending upon the acuity of, you know, your symptoms, um, what could remind you of what you need to do? Well, for me, that speaks to uh, having a daily self-care practice. Yeah. That way, when it's time to turn to these tools uh, in a stressful moment, they're more accessible. Uh, Absolutely. I, I like to uh, practice uh, meditation daily uh, and, uh, you know, running and exercise uh, almost daily. Uh, and also I've, I've kind of uh, picked up a creative hobby, which is uh, learning how to play the guitar, taking lessons, uh, and uh, taking some time off, too, to kind of, uh, as part of my self-care routine, so that, like I said, again, when, when stressful moments do arise, these things are a bit more accessible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And what we say to that is when you stay ready, you don't have to worry about getting ready. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that <laughs> one before, and that's right on time. <laughs> All right. But thank you so much for that. You're Thanks welcome. for being brave and for um, and being vulnerable and sharing that. Um, that's very appreciated. Appreciate You're welcome. It. I'm in all righty. So let's look at a couple of resources, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, I, I found this resource very recently, and um, this is Inclusive Therapist and their website, inclusivetherapist.com. And what really um, prompted you know, me to want to share this was one of their core values is centering the strengths and needs of communities that have been marginalized, oppressed, silenced, erased, and underserved. Um, you know, this is, when I talk about find your tribe, find your village, find your people, this is what I'm talking about. And so with this website, um, they also offer um, continued education, CEs, you know, for professionals. Um, they, they just have a plethora of resources and support on their, on their website. And then we have therapy for black girls. Um, and what I love about this as well as the next one coming up is, you know, it's a whole platform. And so when I make referrals, I don't always make a referral to therapy. I make a referral to this platform because in this platform, there's podcasts, there are blogs, 
you know, there's, um, there's a community, a sense of um, uh, well-being, you know, and community for those who are looking for that and may not, might not be quite ready for um, therapy. And then we have this final one, therapy for, um, for Black men. And they also have, um, you know, blogs and resources and support. And they also have um, coaches, professional coaches for those who are interested. And so, you know, when we're looking at dealing with racial trauma and racial battle fatigue, you know, this is, this is real. You know, although the DSM doesn't recognize, you know, racial trauma, um, unless it's in correlation with PTSD, you know, this is real. This is something that we as professionals are experiencing, whether firsthand or vicariously, you know, this is real. And um, it helps put us in a position to better care for ourselves so that we can better care for our uh, clients who are also in this um, experience in these same type of um, um, experiences. Um, here's references um, that was used for this presentation. And this is how you can reach out. I'm not sure how that yellow mark got there, but hopefully it doesn't interfere with the QR code. If you wanted to scan that um, or just screenshot the a whole slide and how to get a hold of me. Um, so I want us to be able to get through that so that we can be able to tackle, you know, any questions that have come through the chat or um, you have, you know, pressing, you know, before we go. Uh, Danielle, I guess I could turn it over to you to kind of help, you know, facilitate that part if anyone has any, any questions about um, anything that I've shared so far. Yes, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. If you have any questions um, or things you want to bring up, you can put them in the chat. You can also unmute yourself. Oh. Hi, Eric. I just want to say thank you for the presentation about self-care. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use your contact information uh, at a later time to ask some questions myself. And, and my question is kind of going to be a, about, uh, uh, for, and perhaps you said it and I missed it, uh, supports for clients. Because, you know, occasionally I run into clients that have, uh, feel themselves exposed to um, abuse or discrimination, and it's kind of frustrating for them, uh, to say the least. So I was hoping that uh, you'd have uh, some resources that we could refer clients to. Cause this seems to be a lot about uh, self-care, which is important as well. But I'd li also like to have uh, some resources that I could pass along to clients. And I think you said uh, therapy for black men and for black girls or something like that were, were a couple of those resources. Therapy for, yep, um, I'll go back. Therapy for black men. Therapy for Black Girls, mm -hmm. okay. and then Inclusive Therapists. Now, these are this is not places where you're sending people for, for therapy sessions. There's just resources. Is this correct? Um, for, for, yeah, I, I've sent people there for therapy. I've sent them there for support, for resources. Absolutely, because they have an entire platform. And in that platform, you know, uh, clients can kind of scroll through and pick and choose what is more appropriate for them. You know, it may be blogs, it may be, you know, a podcast that resonates with them. Um, it's just, a, it's a community. And I refer, um, you know, clients to a whole community of support. But I am more than happy to connect offline um, for something more um, specific. Um, this was more uh, geared toward, you know, um, you know, utilizing self-care and self-compassion you know, as we navigate this very, very tumultuous terrain um, that we're all in. Thank you. Yes. Is that Brett? Um, someone asked in the chat if the therapy for black men resource is also geared towards black boys. Um, once you're in there and in um, all the sites that are provided, you type in uh, your zip code 
and you know a list of therapists will uh, pop up and they'll indicate in their um, bio in their description if they do uh, children, adolescents, or adults. Folks are also wondering if um, you could show again um, the slide definition of racial trauma. And then um, another question, um, how, if at all, have you seen or um, heard of social workers causing racial fatigue themselves? Causing, projecting that onto clients. So how, if at all, have you seen or heard of social workers causing racial fatigue themselves? <laughs> I'm sorry, that last part is losing me. Um, so I, for my, and I'll probably answer it both ways. Um, so the first part is causing it themselves, meaning projecting it themselves onto other, onto their clients. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the, the most assured way to do that is through implicit bias because implicit bias is, un, it's, 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 it's um, unintentional. It's, it's subconscious. You're not making that conscious effort to do it. And so because, you know, everyone wants to be a good human, no one's going to purposely go out and hurt their client, but it's that implicit part that's unchecked, you know, is where it starts to negatively affect their clients. And so being able to look in the mirror and take a, take a hard look and, you know, explore how have you harmed, you know, your client, you know, and then make changes from there. And then for themselves, it's just the constant exposure to their clients, you know, that vicarious part. And so you're hearing your client and they're, you know, sharing, you know, their racial trauma and their racial battle fatigue. And then, you know, as a social worker, you then take that on because that's just what we do. And, you know, my advice to that is to take care of you, you know, use the self-care, you know, um, find your village, be able to um, also be able to shut down, take a break rejuvenate so that you don't uh, allow yourself to succumb, you know, to someone else's trauma. So I hope answering both ways, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, Cynthia is wondering if you could show the slide of reground yourself and connect with the present moment slide. Thank Five, you. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> that is one of my favorites. You know, I did that in the grocery store <laughs> when I was having an um, anxiety attack when we first hit the, um, the pandemic and everyone had on face masks, we were in a shutdown. Yeah. It was, yeah, so this really works. <laughs> 